greetings. So um, we, we talked about the debate between Bohr and Einstein. And the debate is uh, not just about the cat being dead and alive at the same time. I think I mean, this is a very nice picture. And more than the expressions of Schrodinger and Heisenberg, I like the expression of the cat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the cat must be wondering why it has been put at the center of this controversy between the two intellectual giants. But um, the idea that I want to put forward is that uncertainties are not just there in quantum mechanics. Uh, we also ruled out uh, chaos as a factor in our previous uh, question answer session. But uncertainty is there in classical uh, physics, in classical phenomena and uh, everybody plays the game of chance. So, when you have your cricket captain go and toss a coin to decide who is going to bat first in a cricket match, okay, and you call out heads or tail, and you're hoping that it is not a coin from Shole, which had heads on both sides. <laughs> so, it was a fair coin, okay, uh, which Dhoni must toss, right? It has to be a fair coin and not the coin from Shole. And the reason this toss is significant is because he is only making a guess and he has a 50 percent chance of getting it right. Because the coin could fall either on its head or on the tail and depending on his luck, he's going to win or lose. And now here comes the hidden variables. Is there any intrinsic information which is missing due to which Dhoni is not able to predict that okay, I, it will land on its head? Suppose you give Dhoni more information than what he has. He's just flipping a coin like this, right? But if he knows where he's applying the torque on the coin, okay, how much is it going to spin? What are the air molecules it is going to interact with? Okay, what is the force with which it goes? After what instant it would land? Can he put in all that information and calculate and predict? that it must land on its head. It may be a difficult calculation and we are not worried about the difficulties of the calculation. Assume that you have the ability to solve this problem. So, you put F equal to M A, torque equal to R cross P and put in all the particles the coin would interact with. Okay? And you have an algorithm which will give you an accurate answer. Yes, do not think about the numerical approximations you may have to make. That of course, will generate sources of error, but do not think about those. In principle, if all of this information was available, there is an uncertainty. Okay. Why do we use Maxwell Boltzmann distribution in classical mechanics? It is not because in classical mechanics you cannot keep track of the position and moment of every particle. You believe that you can, but it is too much information to worry about and you do not really need the detailed information about the position and velocity of every single molecule of air which is kicking the other one and tossing around, right? You are not bothered about that, you are only interested in some average properties and you define this average property in terms of the average kinetic energy which defines the temperature, right? 
So, so you do it in an average way. And you are using statistical distributions to define these averages. And this is coming because of the hidden variables. There is some information which is missing. Okay, you, the, whether it is the toss of a coin or the position and momenta of the Avogadro number of molecules in, in air. So, the nature of statistics, the nature of uncertainty is intrinsically different in quantum mechanics. It is not coming because of this hidden variables. And how do you know that it is not because of these hidden variables? That was Einstein's question. That maybe there is some more information available somewhere, which is somehow sharing, which is shared between the two fragment particles. And if you could put in this, so the question is not about how you are going to get this information and solve the complex equations. The question is, is there such information available at all, which you have not accessed? And if you did, would it restore causality in the laws of nature? So, this was the uh, main concern raised by Einstein and Podolsky and Rosen that if you insert the hidden variables uh, into the theory. So, this, this was the debate between Einstein and Bohr and Einstein thought that okay, if you put this information about the medium, about the hidden variables and so on, then you know it could restore. Uh, causality, you will recover causality. And what the Bell's theorem does, it tells you how to distinguish between these two possibilities. That when you are getting uncertainty, is it because of missing information or is it because the, the laws of nature are intrinsically statistical, okay, which was Bohr's position. That it is not because some information is missing as it would be in the toss of a coin. It is because the laws are such that the principle of superposition must hold and entanglement becomes an intrinsic property which um, nature requires you to employ to describe it. Okay? So, how to make a distinction between these two alternatives? This is what the Bell's uh, theorem is about. And you are led to the conclusion that the probabilities that are identified with Heisenberg's argument it, or with the arguments of Schrodinger, Heisenberg and Niels Bohr, which we can collectively call as quantum probabilities, they cannot arise due to any lack of information from any pre-existing local variables. Okay, that is the conclusion that you are led to when you uh, apply the test uh, indicated by Bell's inequalities. So, one term that you will find in literature is um, what is called as a counterfactual theory. So, counterfactual is contrary to fact. Okay? And what is called as counterfactual definiteness is the assumption that not only the measurement you did has a definite answer, but also the measurement that you did not. And you, I need you to keep track of this argument because it is going to come up in our final analysis, uh, which we will be discussing in the next class that this goes back to the same idea that is the moon there if nobody is looking at it. If you measure the position, does it have momentum if you are not measuring it? Okay, can you get information about these other physical properties which quantum mechanics limits you 
and he, quantum mechanic quantum theory does tells you that you cannot get this information then do they have some values if you do not care to measure okay and a counterfactual definiteness this hypothesis is that the physical system will have certain values that you measure but they also have some values that you do not measure okay like we we have a friend outside and uh, we know his name we know many things about him but is he wearing a cap or is he not wearing a cap and if we have not seen him what can we say about this information so if we have not carried out this observation can we then talk about these two as alternatives either he is wearing a cap or he is not wearing a cap if you have not carried out this observation you cannot use this either or vocabulary it would be a state of superposition it would be the cat being either dead or alive okay you you cannot rule out either okay so in a counterfactual theory it is possible to assign a property to a system a physical property to a system even if you do not measure it okay so what john bell did and the mathematical proof is somewhat more complex than what we are going to do here but what we will discuss is to get a flavor of his argument and then with that you can read further literature and get into the details bell set up a certain inequality which we are going to introduce and discuss which must be satisfied by any theory which is both local and counterfactual the locality of a theory is a significant factor here because you are trying to get information about the position and momentum of one fragment from measurements on the other no matter what distance there is between them okay and it is this spooky action at a distance that einstein talked about that we are trying to figure out how to interpret that so bell set up an inequality a mathematical inequality which must be satisfied by any theory that is both local and counterfactual if a theory is local and it is also counterfactual then a certain inequality must hold what quantum correlations do is that this inequality is violated okay which means that the quantum theory cannot be both local and counterfactual it cannot be both because that inequality that we are, will be discussing is violated in quantum theory and i will discuss how it is violated by using elementary uh, things in quantum theory and then we are led to the conclusion that quantum theory is either non counterfactual or non local so you can understand this very easily in terms of venn diagrams that if you have two sets and you have do you define an intersection of a and b and then you have got a certain region which is common to both okay and then if you remove that common part then what you are left with must belong to either the first set or the second okay so it is just this argument which a venn diagram can bring out very easily so that's the idea in using the bell's inequalities and uh, henry stapp who has got one of the very um, widely cited paper 
he points out that the Bell's theorem is the most profound discovery of science. So, that is how important it really is, okay. And it is the joint assumption of hidden variables and the principle of local causation which um, is contradicted in quantum correlations, okay. So, there are certain quantum correlations that we see in experiments. When we carry out an experiment, all the experimental results in our laboratory whether it is spectroscopy or you know anything. So, these are interpreted on the basis of quantum theory, we use the principle of superposition, we use um, probability as defined in quantum mechanics and using these probabilities you talk about the intensity of a certain transition in a spectrum, right. So, these are all governed and driven by this idea of um, uh, quantum correlations. And uh, the conclusion that you are led to when you apply the Bell's inequalities is that the local hidden variables cannot reproduce predictions of quantum theory. And this is what one would have wondered that if you put in this missing information, okay. So, if you put that missing information in the toss of a coin, in principle you can guarantee that you can predict that it will land on heads or tails. But there is no such hidden information that you can think of, which you can put into the laws of nature, so that you can remove causality, you, 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 and uh, so that you can remove the uncertainties and make the theory causal, okay. So, that is the conclusion so that no hidden variables, local um, uh, hidden variables will help you arrive at such a conclusion. You can do so when it comes to a toss of a coin which is whose dynamics is governed by classical laws, but then remember that even a coin is subjected to quantum laws. So, that will also not be predictable, okay. So, these ideas have been tested, the mathematical inequalities have been developed, has have been uh, set up by John Bell in such a manner that you can actually conduct experimental tests and these tests have been carried out by Allen Aspect and uh, Jason or Gesen <laughs> and they show that local variables do not exist, okay. So, the experiments which must, which, which are driven by quantum laws, uh, they lead to certain conclusions that um, the local hidden variables uh, theory will not hold, okay. Now, there have been brilliant arguments by some intellectual giants including uh, uh, David Bohm and so on and you might enjoy reading about it from original sources, okay. So, we now have to develop the formalism and then think about experiments so that we can actually develop the Bell's inequalities and then relate it to some experiments that we uh, can ca carry out and how to test them. And we are going to do it with uh, spin half particles with electrons for example, okay. But uh, to do that, I am going to spend some time revisiting the angular momentum properties of spin half particles. Uh, so all of you would have studied it in your earlier courses in quantum mechanics, so it is nothing new, but maybe some of you have not. And to make sure that everybody is on the same page, I am going to revisit some of these ideas because we need that vocabulary very uh, to be used properly. So, I am going to spend some time um, discussing uh, the spin half angular momentum states. So, the electron has got some intrinsic properties like it has got a certain rest mass, 
it has got a certain charge through so many coulombs, right? So many grams or kilograms or whatever units you use, it has got a certain specific mass. So it has got an intrinsic additional property which is its spin angular momentum, which has nothing to do with this kind of spin of the earth's axis about a rotation. It is an intrinsic property and as a matter of fact, you do not even get it from quantum mechanics. It is, uh, you can get it only from relativistic quantum mechanics, you can get it only from the Dirac equation. You do not get it from the Schrodinger equation. You can put it in an ad hoc manner and say that yes, I need to use it, but it does not come naturally out of the Schrodinger equation. It has to come only out of the Dirac equation. And what it does is that the wave function cannot be represented by the Schrodinger wave function anymore. It has to be a bispinar. There are two states, the spin up and the spin down states. And then you can represent it by a matrix having uh, two rows and one column, right? It is a joint would of course be a row, right? So that you can use the linear algebra associated with the Hilbert space and the dual conjugate space. So, you can define it. So, you, what you have is what is called as a spin orbital, okay? And this is then a linear superposition of the spin up and the spin down state. And you can represent the spin up and spin down as arrow pointing up and down. And you are not going to ask does up means toward hell or heaven or uh, north pole or uh, some other star, right? That is not relevant. What is relevant that there is a certain axis that you take as a reference axis, okay? It is the axis of quantization. And with reference to this axis, what is parallel to it and what is anti parallel to it is all that matters. So, you have got the spin up and the spin down states. And you represent them by the isometrices, which are 1, 0, and 0, 1 that you see on the screen. And the spin orbital, is, the spinar part of this is then just a superposition of these two states. And this is coming because of an intrinsic property of the electron, just like its mass and charge, which is what we call as a spin angular momentum. Um, and the algebra of this angular momentum is described by the SU2, which is homomorphic to the SO3 algebra. So, you are familiar with the SO3 algebra, which is the group of all the rotation operators, which can subject an object, uh, which, which can carry out all kinds of rotations of an object or about any arbitrary axis and bring it to an invariant position. Right? So, this SU2 algebra is then it consists of all uh, complex unitary unimodular 2 by 2 matrices. And I will just remind you of the connections between the O3 and the SO3, the O2 and the SO2. And we have discussed this in some other context, I think in the discussions of the symmetry of the hydrogen atom. When we do the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom, we um, discuss uh, how the symmetry of the hydrogen atom is described and then we admit uh, the recognition that it is described not by the SO3, but by SO4 because of the dynamical uh, symmetry of the Kepler 1 over R type potential, right? So, when you subject an, uh, any, 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 uh, any system to rotations and you describe the system by a set of coordinates and then you describe these coordinates after the rotation, okay? So, there is a set of coordinates, you can think about x, y, z or r theta phi, it does not matter, right? How is the final coordinates x prime y prime z prime at the end of this transformation, how is x prime y prime z prime related to x y z? You can get the rotated coordinates from the unrotated that you begin with 
by applying the rotation operator on the x, y, z. So, that is the equation that you see over here that the r subscript r is this r operator operating on the original coordinate, right. So, that is the coordinate transformation that is affected and you can represent this r by a matrix whose determinant is either plus 1 or minus 1 depending on whether it is just a rotation or it may also involve some inversion or you know there are other symmetries because basically we are talking about symmetry uh, transformations. So, these are represented by orthogonal matrices unimodular, but then you can also have inversions or reflections that is also a symmetry, right. So, if you have an object on one side and you see its image in a mirror, then the image is exactly like this, but if you transform x, y, z to x prime, y prime, z prime which are the coordinates of the image, then the matrix of transformation will have a determinant which is not plus 1, but it will be minus 1, okay. So, certain transformations have minus 1 and some transformations, rotations always have plus 1. So, if you include plus 1 and minus 1 both, then you have a certain group, but a subgroup of this which is a special orthogonal group. So, the SO3, the term S represents special. What is that specialty? That it corresponds to those transformations which are represented by matrices whose determinant is plus 1 and minus 1 transformations are eliminated, okay. So, that is the algebra of SO3. And if you have this in just two dimensions in a plane, then you can do the same kind of analysis um, using uh, O2 uh, algebra, uh, which admits uh, transformations with determinants plus 1 and minus 1 both, but then you have a subset with only plus 1 determinants, which is the algebra of SO2, which is the subgroup, right. So, we are now going to talk about rotations and remi remind yourself that finite rotations are not vectors. They do have a magnitude, they also have a direction, but that does not make them vectors and we do not define vectors as quantities which have got magnitude and direction. We define them by how their components transform when you rotate a coordinate system with reference to which the components are defined, right. So, we have discussed this in our earlier uh, discussions. Finite rotations are not vectors, infinitesimal rotations are. So, you, you can define infinitesimal rotations in terms of uh, this infinitesimal rotation vector which is delta phi. So, I put up an arrow on top of it to represent that it is a vector okay, because it is an infinitesimal rotation, a finite rotation will not carry an arrow on top of it, it is not a vector, okay. So, I like to write a finite rotation as a magnitude times a unit vector because the finite rotation itself is not a vector, okay, but you can define it in terms of this and how do you define it? You can take that finite angle theta, divide it by, by a certain number n and generate the infinitesimal rotation operator and operate it n number of times, okay. So, you can get any finite rotation by carrying out infinitesimal rotations infinite number of times, okay, move slowly and let n go to infinity. So, that is what a operator for finite rotation is, right. And it is defined in terms of these continuous parameters theta x, theta y, theta z, right. And then you can use a spherical polar coordinate system if you like r theta phi, phi can go from 0 to 2 pi, theta can go from 0 to pi, right. And you can ask what is going to happen when you change this angle through 2 pi. Now, 2 pi is one complete rotation wherever you start okay and then you you define some coordinate system and take an object over a complete circle and come back to the same point. You expect an identity operator, right? 
because you have come back to exactly the same point. So, rotation through 2 pi must give you identity. Now, you should ask does it? Okay, is it an assumption that you are going to make? Now, it depends on what you are really talking about. That we do expect identity in the normal course, but now analyze this rotation operator which we have defined in the equation at the top of this slide and put theta equal to 2 pi in that equation. And you are taking some direction unit uh, vector in some direction which I represented as theta caret. So, I just for the sake of argument I consider some direction in space I call it the E z unit vector. So, there is a certain direction and now I think about an angle which is 2 pi and then I write this u r operator this rotation operator. Now, this is rotations are generated by angle of momentum right. So, the rotation about the z axis is generated by the component of the angle of momentum operator about the z axis. So, th so, that is the reason you see the j z coming over here right because it is the uh, scalar product of j with this unit vector e z right. So, you get the j z and then you get uh, from the exponential you get uh, uh, sum of cosine and sine terms. The sine term comes with the square root of minus 1, but the sine of 2 pi m would vanish okay? and the cosine of 2 pi m will give you 1 as you expect that the rotation through 2 pi gives you the unity operator which is fine. But the reason it is it has worked is because the angular momentum that you are talking about is an integer in this case. If j is not an integer and for spin half it is not. Okay? So, angular momentum has got different origins. One is the orbital angular momentum which is always an integer and the other is the spin angular momentum which can be half integer also. Okay. Of course, it can add up for two pieces and give you an integer spin that is a different matter, but intrinsically electron being a fermion it has got a half integer spin and then if you see this cosine 2 pi m will not give you 1 okay, because m will be half. So, you get the cosine of pi rather than cosine of 2 pi and cosine of pi will give you minus 1. So, you do not get the unit operator you get minus 1. So, on completing one full rotation you are not getting the identity you get minus 1. But of course, if you do it one more time then you will get one more minus 1 and then you will get a plus 1. Okay? So, SU2 which describes the angular momentum of half odd integer uh, angular momentum spins right. So, a 2 pi rotation gives you um, minus 1 for spin half particles whereas, for integer spins you will get a plus 1. So, the half integer spin algebra is not described by SO3 it is described by SU2 okay? and then you need twice this rotation. Okay? two circles a rotation through 4 pi not 2 pi which will give you the identity. Okay? So, what it means is that when you are doing quantum mechanics in the context of half integer angular momentum and that is what we will be doing to test the Bell's inequalities. Okay? That is the reason I wanted to uh, come back to this point a little bit and spend some time uh, recapitulating these ideas theta angles must be replaced by theta by 2 because of this. So, when you talk about rotations and if you are carrying over some algebra into our analysis then we must replace theta by theta by 2 and uh, the algebra of the spin half angular momentum is of course, described by the poly matrices the SU2 right. And then you have got the of course, the unit uh, 2 by 2 matrix 1 0 0 1 right and together with those you can describe any arbitrary matrix as a linear superposition of uh, the polymatrices and the 2 by 2 unit matrix. 
And if you now consider a spin orbital and you refer it to a certain frame of reference, which is your EX, EY, EZ, okay? And with reference to this, you have got a two component spinner corresponding to the spin up and spin down. And you refer the same spin orbital, but to a rotated frame, okay? How do you carry out the transformations? So that is the question. So, the rotated frame is a red frame as you see in this picture, okay? And you are referring the same spinor, the two component spinor, now to the red frame instead of the black frame. And when you do that, you must carry out a transformation through this 2 by 2 matrix, which is xi, eta, lambda, mu. These are complex numbers. Xi, eta, lambda, mu. So, how many complex numbers do you have here? Four. How many real numbers do you have? Eight. Each complex number has got two real numbers, right? But then, these matrices are unitary, right? And which means, that you have got unitarity and these are also unimodular matrices. So, the unitarity gives you four equations because the product of uu dagger is equal to 1. So, you can use these four to reduce the number of unknowns from 8 to 4, right? And then you also know that you have got a fifth condition that the modulus of this is plus 1 and then you can describe these by just 3 parameters instead of 8. And these 3 parameters can be any 3 angles, you can define them in different ways. One way of do doing it is through what are called as Euler angles, which we have discussed in um, angular momentum and rotations of uh, objects, right? So, you can define it in terms of three Euler angles, theta, alpha and gamma, okay? You can define them in different ways and using them, you can come up with a description of the angular momentum algebra of spin half particles. So, we are going to do, use some of it and you can introduce these Euler angles in uh, various alternative ways and um, this is from chapter 7 of my book FOCM, uh, this figure. Maybe Saurav has drawn this or I don't know who, <laughs> but one of you has drawn this figure, I think. Uh, so, you can go through the details uh, in that book. And you can define these three Euler angles and then the matrices, the 3 by 3 matrices, which represent the three rotations. And then the composite rotation made up of the three rotations. So, you can define this resultant matrix. So, these are the rotation matrices that we are going to work with, okay? But we are going to do it with spin half particles, not with integer number of particles. So, that is the reason the angles must be replaced by half angles. So, you have to go remember that. So, here the angular momentum is spin half. So, j is equal to sigma over 2 in units of h cross, okay? Saurav calls it h cut, right? <laughs> I think all Bengalis do that, h cut. <laughs> so, uh, the angular momentum is sigma over 2 in units of h cut or h cross, right? So, this is your rotation operator and if you look at this rotation operator corresponding to a rotation through 2 pi, now sigma is a matrix, okay? It is not just a number because we are now dealing with spin half particles represented by spinors. 
So, sigma is a matrix. So, you must expand cosine and sine functions in power series and recombine them and then you get these relationships and you find that this rotation operator leads you to minus 1 as we have discussed earlier, but you can see it very clearly by using the algebra that the spin half particles must um, satisfy, right? So, you get minus 1 over here and you need a rotation of 4 pi twice this 2 pi rotation to get the identity operator. So, in the context of half integer angular momentum, theta must be replaced by theta by 2. So, for 2 pi only gives you minus 1, but 4 pi gives you plus 1. So, uh, remind yourself of this part of quantum mechanics, which I am sure you have been exposed to earlier in your other courses. And then we are going to use these half angles to describe spin half particle states. And then subject them to the interpretation of quantum probability, which is based on the idea of quantum correlation. And compare our predictions of probability with the predictions that we can make using hidden variables. So, we can make certain predictions using hidden variables and those predictions are the Bell's inequalities. And we are going to test, are these predictions consistent with quantum behavior that we observe with the laboratory? Okay, so, that is what um, this test will boil down to. So, we are going to use this algebra of spin half spinor states and uh, the half, into, half uh, angle states. So, um, you, you, you can uh, remind yourself of the algebra associated with this. Um, so, it is coming because of the 2 to 1 homomorphism between SU2 and SO3. So, that leads you to a representation of SO3, which is also a representation of SO, SU2, but not vice versa, because this has to do it twice. So, these are some of the things that we are going to need for our discussion in our next class. And then uh, we will get into the uh, arguments, uh, not exactly the way it is developed in Bell's original paper, but uh, in uh, a manner which will bring out the idea and you will then be able to see what the Bell's inequalities are about and how they test the hypothesis which is either the Bohr hypothesis or the Einstein hypothesis, which of these is correct. Can local hidden variables account for the uncertainties? And when you subject the observations in a laboratory, you will find that that is not the case. Good. I'll stop here for this class and if there is any question we can discuss. Uh, in the rotation matrix in three dimensional, so we are particularly we are doing z direction and x, again z direction we are doing. Is there any reason instead of y direction we are doing z direction? No, we can do that in alternative ways, not necessarily this. There are alternative ways of defining the Euler angles. Um, so, what we did was uh, this is a particular way of mm, yeah. Zx prime, Z double prime, but there are alternative ways of basically you need three rotations, but you can arrive at them in different ways. And as a matter of fact, um, in the literature, this is one of the very common schemes, yeah. but uh, you also have these uh, aerospace engineers and they talk about uh, how a plane is oriented. So, you, you have a plane and it has got a wings like this and the plane can go up and down like this, it can turn like this, right? And it can also spin like this. So, there are three angles. So, they define this yaw and what are, what are the other two? I think uh, pitch and there is a, what is the third? Uh, there is a yaw, there is a pitch. So, so, these are the terms which, so you, you can define it in different ways 
and and uh, certainly in literature depending on how you do the calculations there are alternative ways uh, nothing fundamental about one or the other but they all come down to one simple thing that you need three and only three angles that's what we are concerned about over here that you begin with four complex numbers you need only three real numbers at the end